Welcome to a new episode of PetroPlus Talks. Today, we've got the pleasure of having Boston Consulting Group with us to discuss the latest report on the fuel retailing industry. Titled, A New Era for Fuel Retailers. As we know, the industry is going through a tremendous change. You already released a report, similar report in 2019, uh, where you uh, looked at the future of the retailing industry. Many of the people involved in the industry have many questions about the, uh, the future, digitalization, new fuels. And now we've had a major uh, change in the game, which has been uh, COVID. So I wanted to start with um, um, asking, you know, what, what are some of the biggest surprises that, uh, that you've seen in this report compared to the one that you released three years ago? Uh, maybe we can start with you, uh, Stuart. Yeah, first of all, before we start, uh, in the question, we just want to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today and, and all your listeners here. Um, and let me just start in a little bit about, you said, some of our biggest surprises. Well, in, in 2019, we, we wrote a previous report. And we, as part of that report, we identified three trends we believe would really disrupt the industry by 2030. The first was increasing demand for alternative fuels. The second was the rise of advanced mobility solutions. And the third was evolving consumer expectations on lifestyle. And we saw really these major disruptions were enabled by digital technologies and really a strong enabler to really make these disruptions happen. And overall, I think we are largely correct in our prediction, but the main surprise for us is the realization that the fuel retail landscape was really evolving at a much faster pace than predicted. We knew it was gonna evolve and we again mentioned by 2030, but we really found in the last few years that. The, pace has been much greater. And for some of us, you know, we've been in this industry really for more than two decades. And the, the amount of change in essence does feel remarkable, particularly as if you look back 10, 15 years ago, there wasn't that much change relative to those today. And what are the changes that we're seeing? We're seeing, you know, leading players reversing their strategies on network ownership. You know, we see players quitting long established loyalty programs with third parties to set up their own loyalty programs. And very interestingly, in sort of a whole concept of new business models, which we talked about, we see a real willingness to explore new offers and services going far beyond the station. Now, um, sort of, sorry. Sorry, sir, I carry on. Oh, sorry, yeah. So um, I think a second element I just wanted to talk to you briefly about is that alongside sort of the, if you will, the large global companies who have historically taken this lead in developing the new propositions, we're also seeing going beyond the, if you will, the large global companies, we're seeing regional players, NOCs investing in new ventures, exploring new business models that are really relevant for their market. So again, those are some of the big surprises that we've seen uh, since our last report. And that, that's really interesting uh, stuff. So in this, in this report, it seems like you've, um, you've identified five major trends uh, that we can currently see in the industry, which uh, we're gonna show in a, in the slide right now. Um, and maybe Stuart, you can guide us through through these five trends that you've identified and you think they're gonna have the biggest impact in, on, on the industry. Yeah, so we, we've seen in the past five years, five trends that really stand out. And let me go over each of those in a little bit of detail. So the first one is we see alternative fuels are no longer optional. You know, and if you look at, and really since 2019, just take electric vehicles, for example, the well, sales are up now by 41% since 2019. If you look at the IA forecast, they're forecasting between 125 and 200 million light duty EVs to be used, in use globally by 2030. So a real step change. And as you start to look forward in maybe five years time or so, you start to see a real potential for hydrogen for, or for heavy duty long haul transport uh, in the overall heavy duty and CRT markets. So that's the first big trend. The second is that advanced mobility solutions are really changing usage pattern. So we're seeing this shift from individual use to carpooling, from self-driven cars to more autonomous fleets. And I think the one I find really quite interesting is this whole concept of downtime and productive time during travel. Our, and travel used to be very much this sort of downtime. You're, as you're traveling, you'd be in your car and you weren't being productive. Now people are really shifting the idea that I can be productive during that travel time. Now, it goes without saying COVID-19 has changed things as well. And we see that whole consumer behavior has changed significantly. And I think if you look at, for 
first of all, e-commerce. And sales, for example, hit 18% of the total retail in 21 from 13% in 2019. So it's a dramatic shift in sales from, you know, as I said, 13% to 18% between 2019 and 2021. And the whole concept of, I think we've all experienced this digital restaurant delivery uh, has really grown. And actually we, we looked at this at 67% was the number we looked worldwide in growth. So significant growth there. We also see that digital technologies are expanding retailers' capabilities. So specific retailers are now starting to see the benefits of AI and big data analytics to capitalize on customer data, to really understand their customers even better. And we're also seeing digital has also been able to, not just in the retail market, but also the B2B market, you, digital is really able to help and look at dynamic pricing, which provides further opportunities for, for fuel retailers. And that, that, that opportunity could be both in the fuel side, but also the non-fuel side. I think very importantly, we've seen sustainability take root, root as we say, root for real. And there is much more stringent regulations today, and we see many more coming into the future. There's also from the consumer side, there's a real demand for sustainable projects. And from work that we've seen, almost 60% of consumers prefer recycled items as an example, uh, and 65% they, they are reducing their plastic use. So real changes in the habits of consumers. And consumers are willing to shift if there is price parity. And I think this is really important. If the prices come down, if prices are a parity with other non-sustainable products, so consumers will go after those sustainable products. Again, really, again, if you look across the board, those five major trends that I discussed are trading a real shift in the market and a real shift in the, the driving this faster uh, than predicted pace that we talked about uh, in our report three years ago. Yeah, I must say that I completely agree with that. And I've uh, speaking to retailers and uh, trade shows that I, that, that I normally attend. Um, it's been amazing the, how, how fast some of these trends that were first spotted a, few, a couple of years ago have, have just started to, to change the shape of the industry. Uh, Mirko, if I, if I could ask you, you know, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the, in the fuel retail industry in, uh, in the last uh, years, both in the US, in Europe, and, and kind of all around, all around the world. We've also seen OMCs, you know, coming back to ownership of, of sites, getting, you know, getting back into that direct contact with the with the retail business. Um, looking at you know lots of different sides and taking account of the changes in the industry, how can retailers you know best come about planning their networks today to to make the most of them? Yeah, no, thanks a lot for the question, Oscar. Now, indeed, for retail is a, is again very important in the portfolio of all companies. I mean, it's uh, it's became uh, great, gained a lot of importance in the recent years, and the reason are are clear, you know, it provides some diversification from hydrocarbons, exposure to non-fuel and new value pools. And it's very synergic with the effort that all companies are doing the energy transition. You know, if you think about the EV, hydrogen, and also it really represents the real only contact points with end users and their data. So in, in this context, yes, all, full, all the players are consolidating. And this is a reason, the reason behind that is a need for scale. You know, when you launch, you need to launch new digital business models, you need to invest in new value chains, you know, in alternative fuels. These are all elements that need scale, that can leverage economies of scale and things small players can already afford. So consolidation is driven by these new investments and new kind of concepts that you need to be developed. Site ownership instead is driven more by the need for all the players to experiment and launch new formats. And to, when you experience experiments and, and you test new formats, you need to be in control of the format, so the asset, you need to control of the operatorship, you need to be in control ultimately of the customer experience. And this is essential in, the, in phases of transition like this one, where you need to test and experiment new things. So that's why also we see also coming back to site ownership. Now, coming back to, you, to your main question, you know, how can retailers best plan for their networks? Uh, today, I mean, most sites are, are prioritized and taught with the logic of volume by margin, right? With the logic of which sites could sell the most the highest volume of diesel or gasoline. This will not all true when you think the network in the future will probably offer new services, will offer e-commerce, will offer EV, other alternative fuels, 
this logic might not hold through. So we need to rethink and repurpose the network early enough so that we can move quite early and, and, uh, and do it eff efficiently from an economic standpoint. I just give an example. When you think about a small urban site with very high gasoline throughput, that was probably a tier one for most players. But when you project it in, uh, in 10 or 20 years, and you think about EV and, and other form of uh, other business models, you could expect these sites to become more and more marginal because you know, there is no space for, for example, for non-fuel. EV in urban area, you know, there is a, could be, the, the potential could be limited and, and there is not many other source of, uh, of revenues in, at the site. Uh, so also for e-commerce or for other things. So, and, and vice versa, you might find that sites that today we consider tier two, tier three, but they have a lot of space, for example, on the forecourt, in the future, they can become new mobility hubs or maybe could be ideally positioned close to demand center for e-commerce. So, I mean, the first thing players should do is start to think which new services, which new fuels will, will sell in the future and remap their network against that and see which sites could offer the highest potential considering the new demand center that will differ and change depending on what they plan to sell, which services and products they plan to sell in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, retailers certainly have um, a lot of choices to make, and uh, and sometimes you know having the data to make those choices is uh, it can be quite strenuous. One of the difficult decisions that uh, retailers have today is uh, which energy to to bet on. Um, Mirko, which I think we're gonna we're gonna stay with you, and we're gonna have another slide for this uh, this topic. It's you know probably the hottest topic that we've had uh, in our industry for the last uh, ten years or more. We know that the EVs is having a massive push, both from the governmental side, from uh, the car manufacturers, and from many players in the society. Um, so through the, through the data that you've that you've that you've got from the study and your conversations with retailers, you know what type of energies are they looking at, and what how are they making those decisions? Yes, no, thanks. Uh, no, as Stuart mentioned before, um, alternative fuels are no longer optional, right? So there will be definitely a mix. Today, we think mostly about uh, two or three products. In the future, we need to think about a broader mix of products that we offered. It might differ depending also on geography and markets. Uh, today, obviously, electric vehicles are gaining significant traction and they are clearly in pole position. Uh, there are clear reasons behind that. You know, there is a clearly future bans on the sale of internal combustion engines, uh, government subsidies, but also bigger, greater affordability and wider availability of models or cars models. And these are bumpy V sales quite a lot. So obviously if we are, are in poor position in our latest survey, 95% of full retailers are offering or are planning to offer EV charging points on their side. So clearly EV is very the, the most, uh, uh, the, the product in uh, kind of the kind of fuel more in, um, in poor position. Besides that, I mean, there is also second generation biofuels and hydrogen. I mean, 55% of uh, our respondents to the survey are planning also to offer either of the two or, or both of them. And, um, and, and these, they also have the potential to be an important low carbon, low carbon fuels, particularly when you think about hydrogen, particularly for heavy duty transport, such as trucks and, and, and bus, that's we clearly have a, a quite early, early head start. Uh, so we will see a lot of them, particularly on highway and uh, on the big uh, routes for, uh, for uh, long haul carriers. Um, but clearly EV today, especially for, for cars, is a, is a clear head start. Uh, but we see in hydrogen a lot of regional partnerships that have been created in Europe, China, US for, uh, to enable mass market rollout of, uh, of hydrogen fuel heavy duty transportation. So as we said, in the future, we will see much more of a, of a, of a mix of uh, alternative fuel will be offered. So there will not be a single part, a single, a single bullet to low carbon transportation. We will see different players, different markets experimenting different, uh, um, different low, carbon, low carbon fuels. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Ali, and there's been a lot of debate in the last um, few, well, a few weeks and last month since the, um, since the approval of the, the European Union to, um, to ban ICEs from 2035, you know, that, uh, Germany and Italy are trying to open up the opportunity to maybe include uh, e-fuels and uh, our industry is quite um, focused on that. Uh, 
Nico, with the, with the massive increase of EV adoption and charging infrastructure, a lot of retailers feel like this is going to result in a, in a significant loss of income for, for, the, for the business. If that is the case, um, how, how would they be able to, to mitigate that, that, that loss? Indeed, that was the question also that triggered our initial question, even the, our first report, you know, three years ago. But no, I mean, the answer is not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, and there are two, I mean, two sides of that. First of all, the EV value chain is being shaped as we speak. You know, there are different players, these actors in the electric vehicles value chain, charging value chains, right? You know, you have the mobility service provider, the MSPs, the charge point operator, CPOs, the asset owner, the energy resellers. And full retailer, the retailer are still experimenting which roles they want to play along the value chain. You know, apart from the, what you expect as an asset owner, I mean, when you want to really have a contact with the end user, uh, you know, many are thinking to position themselves as mobility service providers. And this changed completely the value pools that they can tap on in the EV value chain. But when you think about full retailers, we should not think about just in the old fashion, just the refueling parts so or the, the charging parts with the EV. We need to think all what is around that. You know, we, we talk about the non-fuel, you know, potentially the e-commerce. There are a lot of value pools that rotate around the recharging or refueling, right? So there is a, the non-fuel, there is a, the mobility convenience hub that, you know, they can definitely, for retailers can position themselves. Uh, there is a lot they can do owning the data to having better loyalty and personalizations. Uh, I mean, and they can launch many new services and businesses, leveraging the many contact points with end user. If it's, well, as you see in our reports, you know, we have clients that, you know, launch new insurances or, or financial services or many other things around either the asset life cycle of the car, but also beyond the car, just thinking about the customer as, a, as an individual, which we can, uh, which we have a lot of contact points. So there are many other value pools we can access. So we should not think just uh, changing the dispenser or gasoline with the EV uh, charging point, but we need to think about all the broader value pools you can, uh, you can tap on. So the answer is, uh, despite EV, not necessarily this will result in a loss, in a net loss for food retailers. Actually, in some cases, if the, the players act early and decisively, I mean, we can see also the transformation can also bring new growth vectors for the food retail industry. Mm -hmm. uh, when when a, a lot of people involved in the fuel retailing industry look at hydrogen as a, as, as a much more of a similar solution than, than, than they provide and perhaps less of a, of a fundamental challenge to, to their industry compared to, to um, battery powered vehicles. Uh, Stuart, do you think it's, it's a feasible idea to think that uh, adapting a convention, conventional liquid fuel station to become a supplier of hydrogen to heavy duty vehicles is, um, will become someday a, a viable business opportunity? And perhaps, depending on the location, some retailers could start moving ahead in that game? Well, maybe I should start this question by answering or uh, mentioning that I actually I actually started my career back in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, developing hydrogen fuel cells for light duty and heavy duty applications. And it's, it's, really, it's really fantastic to see the re-emergence, if you will, of this technology and becoming much more viable. Now, from a BCG perspective, I think in the short to medium term, we don't see a major role for hydrogen to play really across the network of service stations, and particularly not for light duty vehicles. However, in the longer term, it may be beyond 2025, 2030, uh, we are optimistic that hydrogen could be most widely or more widely adopted, if you will, for, uh, fuel for the long distance, the heavy duty trans, uh, tr duty trucks and potentially bus transport within cities. Um, and this is particularly, it's differentiated the technology given, if you will, the range limitations of the battery powered electric vehicles. Now, now how, do, how do companies really Competing in this market and establish this position. So, really think to establish position and comfortably meet the demand, companies would need to build up a critical mass of stations uh, offering hydrogen by the time, you know, the 2025-2030 timeframe. This sort of critical mass is really needed to really build up and scale and give consumers or customers confidence in the, in the industry. And the best way really to meet this opportunity for, for OEMs and partners and players in the industry is through partnerships across the value chain. 
uh, and the whole idea of generation of hydrogen, the distribution and storage of hydrogen. And really OEMs and fleet customers really need to play a big role. And there are some good examples of this coming out. So uh, Total Energy and Hyzon Motors uh, have agreed to develop hydrogen for refueling uh, and vehicle supplies for long haul customers. So that's come through as a partnership. Um, also Shell is engaged in partnerships with Daimler Truck to launch heavy duty refueling stations uh, covering about 1,200 1, kilometers by 2025 with a, a, even a deeper plan to deliver 150 hydrogen refueling stations and around 5,000, if we have the numbers uh, from our numbers, Mercedes-Benz heavy duty fuel cell trucks by 2030. So these are real commitments and this is what we wanna see more of to really promote and, and, and energize the hydrogen fuel cell industry and particularly for tr trucks. Uh, we see sites located on expressways, motorways and dedicated truck stops are the primary locations where hydrogen supply would really take place to make most sense. Yeah, and we we definitely see the work that um, HG Mobility is doing in Germany, where actually in the beginning they focused on, on light duty vehicles, and now they've kind of like done a shift in their strategy to focus on, on heavy duty. I think kind of like um, you know, seeing that there's going to be quite a lot of support coming from, from the for a European level for, for, for that sector. Uh, be, before we move on away from fuels, just wanted to see if um, if any of you had uh, seen the recent events that uh, political events have happened around the uh, the Baron ICEs and the debates. Did do you see e fuels and synthetic fuels uh, playing a major role? Um, did, if there is a significant turnaround um, at a political level, per, perhaps for 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 the future of the of the retail industry? I don't know if anybody wants to wants to jump in. Um, yes, I mean, uh, the, currently uh, uh, the view within the, the BCG is that uh, we don't anticipate uh, e-fuels to, uh, to take a, a large share uh, of the uh, uh, road transportation fuel and certainly uh, um, uh, as far as the, the sort of retail service station business is, uh, is impacted. Um, as we said in the report, we, uh, we looked at several technologies and uh, EV is really the ones and biofuels uh, are really the two uh, major uh, alternative fuels that we see uh, taking momentum. Um, so we keep watching the developments, but uh, as we stand, uh, uh, we don't see a major role uh, for e-fuels and uh, to take place uh, in, in the industry going forward. Mm -hmm. um, Savio. Well, and I, I see I see this a lot when I when I go to some of the uh, the, the events and, and you're sitting as a retailer and you see some conferences, much like sometimes they were the ones that uh, BCG might, might have done as, as well as other people. And sometimes you know so, some retailers may feel a little bit alienated from the conversation due to the time scale that that is being discussed, the levels of uh, of investment. So if if a retailer came to you and said you know how in the short term how can they improve the, their business and what, what, what things can they do today and in the, in the very near future to, um, to kind of like get ahead? I think, first of all, it's a, it's a very fair question. And uh, regarding timelines, um, retailers are coming from all markets across the, the world. We expect changes that will take place at different speed across markets. And, and sometimes uh, even within the same country, uh, depending on site types and customer preferences, Historically, the fuel retail industry has had to focus really hard on cost and efficiency. So I understand the, 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 if you're on the focus that they, they want fuel retailers, they really want to invest smartly and at the right time to, uh, to transform their networks and uh, the customer value propositions that Mirko uh, talked about earlier. So in the short term, to answer your, your questions, I think retailers can focus in, uh, in several areas to improve their, their business whilst keeping their spend uh, under control. Uh, number one, I think they need to continue to digitalize the, the forecourt and the, the backcourt operations. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we saw a steep uh, acceleration of uh, companies' digital programs, uh, largely driven by health and safety reasons. So we saw contactless payment, pay at the pump, app ordering, uh, proliferating if you want. These investments bring more speed and convenience, but also they can contribute to a lower operational cost for, for retailers. Second, listen to the customer and uh, evolve your non-fuel offers as needed. Again, the players uh, who thrived during the pandemic were the ones who were very, very quick to uh, pivot and change their store layouts, introduce uh, new product categories and new services whilst adjusting their, their supply chain accordingly. 
Third, expand the reach beyond the station. I think Mirko uh, talked about it earlier. The rise of omnichannel means delivery services now are becoming a must-have for food and, uh, and popular sister items. What you're showing on, this, on the screen is that we've talked about new needs, uh, which are emerging, of course, based on those trends. However, in one of our surveys, uh, we find that customers' expectations around speed, convenience, safety, cleanliness, remain as strong drivers to visit the service station today as before. So any progress uh, made in those areas is likely to increase customer satisfaction and, and pay dividends uh, for retailers. Yeah, it's actually uh, really interesting that um, it's an American company called CAF that uh, they do hy hygiene for sites in the US and they've done a lot of work on this. And through uh, the COVID times, it seems like the, the level of, of hygiene and cleanliness has been uh, has increased massively. And according to some studies by Gasperi, it became for a while the number one choice to decide if you went to a, a site or another, which is, which is really interesting, uh, right, Xavier? Yeah, I think I'm not surprised by this. We've, we've seen this, uh, um, I mean, as consumer, first of all, as motorists, as users, but also uh, we've seen this talking to, to our clients. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another major trend that we've seen over the, um, over the, the last uh, couple of years has been uh, how loyalties is, is uh, absolutely exploding in our industry. And, and we're seeing new ways of, of adding to loyalty programs. We're copying some moves that were already happening in other industries. Uh, there can be, for example, subscription programs that uh, they first started in Starbucks and moved into the car wash. And now we're actually seeing how they can fit into our industry as well in many other ways. And um, personalization is also becoming a big thing. So, Xavier, what, what can you tell us about these, uh, the, these trends that are, are changing by the day? We think it's a major change and we dedicate, uh, I think, uh, a chapter in, in our new report on this. I think the major change is coming from, uh, first of all, hyper personalization. Uh, today, digital technologies allow companies, few retailers, but not just the few retailers, to target really the segment of, uh, of one. So going forward, we see uh, hyper-personalization as a key driver for uh, data monetization, but also for successful uh, loyalty programs. So as a result, uh, what we expect to see is leading retailers to move away from one size fits all earn and burn programs to new loyalty programs supported by um, AI. Uh, these uh, enable retailers to tailor really spot offers to customers to, uh, to engage with them at the most appropriate moment and also to intervene in the sort of uh, in the customer routine with ad hoc marketing mini campaigns. Retailers uh, can measure the effectiveness of their personalized actions compare with uh, control groups at the very granular level, but also they can change the tactics uh, to attract some of the less engaged customers that they have. Um, so that's one change. The second change is around the scope. Uh, today, a majority of loyalty programs are, are focused on the fueling experience and they are limited to the fuel retailer. Uh, in the future, we expect an increasing number of programs to go beyond the station. Uh, to provide, if you want, broader lifestyle benefits and include multiple preferred vendors for customers to earn and burn through not just one channel, but multiple channels. Uh, the rapid growth and uh, the popularity of uh, Kenza program in, in Morocco, developed by the Aqua Group, uh, is a good example of uh, how much opportunity can be uh, unlocked uh, through the diversification and also uh, customer centricity. The two retailers have an advantage there. They have a wide network of customers and they can leverage that network to build partnership with um, other non few retailers, which is going to enable scale quickly and efficient also enable the efficient customer acquisition. Um, yep, there's definitely... Um, uh, so, Shari, from, from your perspective, do you feel like um, few retailers are, are speeding up into, into the loyalty space? Do you feel like they're generally they're, they're doing a good job or do you feel like they've been a bit late to the party, but there's still room to, to improve? What we see is, uh, I think, uh, a real realization amongst retailers that um, uh, they historically didn't know a lot about their customers, really. Um, 
you know, I can name a couple of, uh, of, of, of very large retailers uh, who have millions of uh, daily transactions. And up until recently, um, and they have targets to actually increase those number of daily transactions. So they, they understand the importance of, of those interactions. Uh, but up until recently, they didn't know a lot about their, their customers. So uh, in, our, in our report, we quote uh, um, a result from the survey that 60% of uh, the few retailers now are investing into uh, uh, billing capabilities uh, in, in order to uh, uh, track, monitor, and analyze uh, big data. So that's a good step. Uh, that's the good first step if you want in, in the right direction. But also a number of your few retailers today are saying that uh, they still, they themselves acknowledge that they still have uh, quite, quite a, a long road or they're still on a journey, if you want, uh, to be able to extract the value from, uh, from, uh, from uh, this customer data. So I think the realization, data monetization, uh, the customer acquisition, if you want, data acquisition is, is there. It's uh, how they're going to leverage and how quickly they're going to leverage um, the richness, if you want, of uh, the entire potential of that data that's going to make the difference for them. Mm -hmm. um, changing topic, we obviously sustainability is, is, um, is becoming one, one of the, the key factors to, to attract uh, and keep customers in any uh, market or industry in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the current world. And uh, especially when you look at the younger demographics, so in this position that we're in now with this uh, shift in, uh, in energy as uh, we're changing from traditional liquid fuels retailers to more of a mobility multi-energy uh, hubs, what strategies can traditional fuel retailers implement to improve that public perception that uh, maybe some of those younger generations have of those brands? Yes, again, I mean, uh, a, a big question and a question that has been uh, sort of asked uh, amongst, amongst our clients uh, very regularly. So I'll, I'll make suggestions. I don't think I can make, uh, you know, give clear advice there, but uh, maybe some of the suggestions that we can think about. Um, firstly, I think retailers can and, and they should really work on their operations. Uh, it's not always the most uh, visible part, but uh, the retail side of the future needs to be more sustainable. Uh, for instance, uh, the materials being used uh, for the building consume less energy. Uh, solar panels generating the power, or at least some of the power that the site uh, requires. Um, LED lighting for the store. Biodegradable uh, products and recycled water for, for the car wash. Um, local or organic food sourcing for shops uh, that have fresh uh, offers. Um, Scott mentioned this earlier, the reducing or even stopping the, the use of plastics. All these could be really positive steps uh, that could resonate with the, the customers. Indeed, uh, according to um, one of the studies we saw from Euromonitor, the Global Consumer Trends for 2021 study, um, almost 59% uh, of consumers prefer recycled items and uh, I think 64% said that they are reducing their use of plastics. So first of all, work on your operation. Um, secondly, um, of course, it's about you know marketing more sustainable fueling products and solutions contrib contribute to improve the public perception among uh, amongst customers. So, if you take the regular motorists, for instance, as, as Scott mentioned earlier, it's about the EV charging points. It's also about uh, biofuels. It's also about carbon offsets for for drivers who are really uh, conscious about the impact of of, uh, of their actions. I would like to minimize the, uh, the impact to opt for na nature-based uh, solutions, for instance, offset solutions. And for commercial road transport customers, uh, this could be around uh, green, uh, uh, well, hydrogen, green preferably, but also renewable diesel, um, but also services uh, such as um, route and uh, vehicle optimization tools uh, and services for fleets. So we anticipate also that the public perception is likely to improve as, if you want, price parity between uh, fossil fuels and uh, sustainable alternatives becomes uh, a reality, which is the, the current uh, the current trend. Yeah, and I would also uh, add, I would also add here that uh, the 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 full retail brand for integrated oil and gas company is the most visible part of the business. So, I mean, the effort you will do to rejuvenate and to and to make uh, the brand uh, uh, more modern, more sustainable. We also reflect on the full company, on the efforts that the company is doing as a whole in the energy transition, uh, in the energy transition. Maybe in part of the business that are not so visible, 
but actually the brand and the service station is the one that will uh, will stuck in the consumer head. So the, the, the effort there is twice as important for for integrated oil and gas company. Yeah, that's very, that's a very interesting point um, of. Uh, how they're, they're the face of, of their industry and then in the first point the customer sees. In a, to, to touch upon a couple of more things of, of your report, um, and Savio, I think you just mentioned this, uh, the report says the fleet will likely become a more important market for, for a few retailers. So how can retailers capitalize on that? And uh, I'm not sure if uh, who wants to take this one. No, indeed fleet, you know, indeed fleet will become uh will become part of the equation, right? I mean, it's today, today, also today is a very important part of the business for, for, for retailers. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about EVs, we always focus on the B2C, but actually the B2B is equally important and actually developing a very effective uh, EV offering also for our B2B customers is, a, is also a, almost a defensive move. For example, installing EV chargers at the sides of our uh, customers, B2B customers that operate the fleet. Uh, that is, a, is not only a growth opportunity, but actually it's even a defensive move because uh, those fleet will look for, for uh, some, uh, some partner that will, will help to, to recharge their, their fleet once they become electric in, you know, in, the, in the near future. So it's uh, having also a clear EV, EV strategy in general, a renewable uh, alternative fuel strategy for for the B2B side, for the for the fleets, but also for you know the uh, more kind of industrial customers for uh, for, for fuel retailers is very important. And it's not only the fuel, I mean is is the broader offering in terms of sustainability things about the lubricants and other things that also will need to to also be uh, coherent with the value proposition of sustainability that we want to offer. Just to add on what Mirko has said, I think uh, a number of players are looking for help, and um, they have, uh, you know, they they, they they have an ambition. They have, uh, in some cases, uh, commercial uh, players have targets uh, to basically uh, decarbonize their operations. They're not always sure how to go about it, and and uh, we've mentioned, I think, several times today, but also in the in the report, the need for partnership, and. Um, I think um, you know, oil companies, integrated oil companies, few retailers can be uh, can become a partner uh, to help some of those uh, companies, B two B companies, to uh, to decarbonize uh, by offering, as Mirko said, the full suite not just of products but, uh, but also services. So uh, I think they have a role to play, and we've seen a number of those uh, players who are actually expanding again or re-entering countries. Uh, which uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, uh, they, they left and now they see, they see the potential and the opportunity again. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, I, I was speaking to um, somebody for, from Shell recently about their return to Italy and, and we're actually um, talking about the potential of, of, of getting back into the fleet uh, business and, and helping those fleets through this energy transition and, and being them, those, you know, the, those, those partners and and I guess, it's, as you say, it's a defensive move because if, if you don't uh, cater for that, somebody else might take that position. Um, also, let's think, let's think very, I mean, when you talk about scope one, it's okay, but when you think about scope one, two, and three, I mean, the, the carbon content of our fuel impact the carbon position of our clients, right? So it's, uh, and that, that's where it becomes very important, you know, to, to be able to, to support the decarbonization effort on, on this aspect. So, uh, I think it will become more and more important for because B2B clients are the one that actually will have to do with the scope one, two, and three, right? Not B2C. So, and uh, so that will become more and more important when uh, all companies will have their clear decarbonization roadmaps. Yeah. And the traditional uh, fleets have, uh, have always been the first movers. Um, well, one, one last thing I'd like to touch upon from, from your report, uh, it, there's a lot of emphasis on, on new, uh, new business areas that the retailers can look at, they see the revenues diminishing, uh, part of that can be last mile logistics and dark stores, so I want to see if you could like, you know, just speak on this, on this a little bit, and maybe, uh, I don't know if you have a few examples that you think of, of companies that are doing this successfully, and, and how can this, you know, be a part of, of, of their business uh, going forward? Maybe I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, 
you know, we just talking just generally about new business models and so forth. You know, we, as I said, I guess at the very beginning, we see this as a really prime opportunity, and and, and we see a, some exciting new value pools and very much in, in this area, and and you know, this is you know a very important area for companies really to push. Uh, uh, push the and, and go after new areas that are, are open in the market in goods mobility, people mobility. So are some of the big opportunities areas there. Now, some, some of the, and some of the companies, and what are the kind of the areas that companies are going into? They're going in all different areas. They're going into insurance markets to look after that. They're going at in maintenance and how you can, how you can do maintenance and more on-demand maintenance. You can looking at fuel delivery options, in, you know, a mobile fuel delivery option. You're looking at options around logistics networks. So how can I use my service stations as a logistic network and really build out from that? And so some, some interesting, I won't go into a whole list of them, but some interesting examples. Um, in Malaysia, uh, uh, Petronas developed Logistica. Uh, and Logistica is really this really exciting opportunity that they use their service stations as a logistics network and a logistics network uh, to serve multiple different customers from the actual base and using the power and the scale of the service stations they have today to do that. You see the concept of mobile field delivery, which you know has come up quite a bit. You see that's starting to really push into the market. You know, you have companies like Shell that moved into the areas like Tap Up and so forth to go after that mobile field delivery. Uh, you, you'll, I think you'll also start to see, as I mentioned before, you'll see companies doing much more than just mobile fuel delivery. They're going to be doing mobile maintenance services. And I think that will be the next, some of the next frontier that you'll start to see as well. Um, so that, that is a sort of some of the areas that we, we can see right now. Um, and I think there's many more that we maybe don't even know that we're there right now. You know, and as new players start to enter the market, new partnerships start to form, I think there's some exciting, exciting new opportunities as well. So again, that we see as sort of the bold and exciting space in the market. But I, I, I don't want to, for people to think that that's sort of the big area you have to go into there, you have to go into those others. It's focusing on all, and if you see in the report, we talked about sort of four, four things that you have to really do. You have to rethink about your network today. You have to reimagine the service stations. You have to think about loyalty and personalization. You have to go after some of these new growth areas. So going after those new growth areas is part of a strategy um, across all four areas. And we think that those going after those four areas will help companies win in the future. And this, this is where the new business models are going, going after those four areas and strategies that I just talked yeah, about. And, uh, and to add to that, I mean, the areas, I mean, in the report, we list a few, many examples of that, but just to, three big buckets. You, know, you have the car life cycle, where clearly for retailers have the right to win with the customer, you know, they, they are perceived as a, as a trustworthy partner. Where, and that is start from uh, where you buy your car, you know, for example, you know, if you take Baba cars, you know, in, uh, uh, in Petrol Office in Turkey, I mean, there is a clear example where there is a platform for buying used cars, from financing the cars, from insuring the cars, you know, you take uh, Bima for Enoch, uh, in, in Dubai, there's a clear example, then to, to maintain the car, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a clear value pools around the car life cycle. And that's, I think, clear right to win for food retailers. There is a clear right to win into the people mobility. People mobility is the other big value pool that's going very fast. And, uh, and we see already many, many examples, partnership with the, uh, with the Uber of this world and many other examples of, uh, of people mobility. And then there is a goods mobility. So these are the, kind of the three big buckets if you want to you know, simplify. And in goods mobility, there is uh, all the last mile delivery and all the logistic, uh, logistic plays you can think of. In these three areas, we found both looking at example benchmarks, but also uh, what we believe could make sense in the future because many of these things are still need to further be developed, is area where the food retailers are right to win. But then there is a lot of other areas that are specific to individual companies because maybe they have a specific partnership with, or maybe they have specific data they have access to, and that they can have a right to win in a completely different areas. And only looking at the real data that the, the company has access to, where you can really analyze and see where we can actually have a competitive edge against others, 
in launching a new product and services. Now, beyond these three buckets, I would think apply, I mean, in our experience, apply for a lot, most of our companies or, or food retailers. But we found also that there are very, very specific cases that apply for to individual companies in which they have a massive competitive advantage. And maybe it's not so, in some cases, it will not be such a, an intuitive kind of area where food retailers will play, but actually found playing in areas where they found data that they were not even aware of at the beginning of, uh, of the analysis. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating stuff. Um, well, I think we're, we're, we're coming to, to an end here. I, um, I encourage everyone that's, um, that's gonna watch this and to, to read the report. Uh, we'll put the link on, on the Petroplaza article. Uh, we already published the, um, the, the news on, on our site. And these kind of reports are extremely helpful for, for the industry as they try to navigate these uh, murky waters and uh, where since the, the correct strategy is not very clear and there's all these new business avenues to, to enter. And um, it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Xavier and uh, Mirko and Stuart. Um, it's been a pleasure and I hope uh, we do it again.